At Direct Service Garage Doors, we are your one-stop shop for all things garage door. From garage door repair and broken spring replacement to new garage doors and openers, we do it all. We're proud to be among the highest rated local garage door companies in all of Central Arkansas. Our highly trained technicians are available 24 hours a day at no extra cost to you. So if you have an emergency, call us today, 501-244-3667, or visit our website at directserviceoverhead.com. Don't wait days. We'll fix it now. Yo, what's going on, Arkansas Razorback fans? Welcome to another Thursday pregame pregame live show. If I could speak clearly, <laughs> um, appreciate you guys for coming by, stopping by. That is, do us a favor, like, share, subscribe to the channel. Of course, go to Hogville.net for all your uh, the 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 latest from our writers. We've got Otis Kirk back ish. He's back. He's uh, planning to go with us on Saturday. We mentioned that. I think we mentioned that last weekend in the post game. So I think we're going to get Otis Kirk Dudley with us up on the box. So that'll uh, that's that'll be exciting. The three of us holding things down in the Matt press box. Matter put on him to calm him down. What's that? Matter put a leash on him to calm him down. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll probably chain him to the to the chair and uh, just <laughs> just kind of feed him or just kind of hold the cup up with with the straw to his mouth, let him sip his tea, and that's going to be about. The extent of his work on Saturday, uh, but yeah, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. Go to Hogville.net. Everything's free there. And uh, Kevin McPherson's got you on basketball. Dudley, who's covering a little bit of everything, but baseball as well uh, and football, helping out with football. And then, like I said, Otis Kirk. All right, shout out to Direct Service Overhead, the Garage Door Repair Company. Do appreciate them as the show's sponsor. Appreciate appreciate what they do. All right. It is uh it's family weekend, Dudley. It's here. We get uh we get we get Bobby Petrino in Missouri State, the Bears coming into town. What a listen, you covered the hogs when he was here. I I can remember once upon a time ago listening to you on the radio talking about I don't know, I always view that as just such a glorious time in Razorback history up until 2012. Uh are you expecting like are we gonna are we gonna count the amount of neck braces Saturday or are we just gonna try to get a rough estimate? Yeah, I guess we'll go with a rough estimate. Uh, you know, I've never had anything bad to say about him professionally. Uh, yeah. he's a tremendous offensive mind. Uh, you know, had a lot of success when he was here, had a lot of people willing to fix the things because they were winning. And you could honestly say that the uh, program went in the ditch. And while it had its uh, components of, uh, of winning and, and some and some progress, it didn't really get back on track until uh, Coach Pittman arrived, and really after that first year. So it's uh, I think it's fitting that uh, those two guys are going to be on opposite sidelines, uh, you know, this weekend. Uh, two very good coaches that came about their jobs in different ways. Uh, and like I said, I would never have anything to say about him, anything to say about him bad professionally. Yeah. As, as a fan at the time, I mean, I'll admit it. Anyone who's followed me long enough, they know I'm, I am a Razorback fan. I, I, I remember when they hired him, that was such a big deal and it had been rumored for a couple of days and then it just happened. What was it like as a member of the media covering him? Obviously, up until 2012, what was that like? Uh, there were always eight-minute press conferences, uh, however many questions and answers you could get in in eight minutes. Uh, that was kind of a standard deal. Uh, he was good in answering the questions that we asked, just didn't like to ask a lot of them. Uh, for the most part, uh, he explained uh, you know, what he was doing in, in terms that uh, not only uh, you know, those who you know, watched or played football could understand but also the fans i think he got across you know to them uh and great offensive teams you know a uh, lot of talent there but again just as he's doing with missouri state right now he takes the players that he has molds his offense to them and that's why yeah. they've been successful in division two or division division one double a i guess it is now the uh uh and while, you know, he's been successful anywhere he goes, it's because he is a great offensive mind. 
I, I always got the vibe when he was here. That was his program from head to toe. I mean, that it, his his DNA was all – I mean, it was that was him. And I know we, we want to concentrate on Missouri State. We do want to get to that. But something I, I – you know, and, and we're hoping, if everything goes according to plan, we're going to have DJ Williams up here at 1130, and I can't wait to talk to him about his time under Petrino. But I always felt like when you took him out of the equation, it was like a game of Jenga. You know, the game where you build block by block, piece by piece, and you pull that piece out, well, it just all falls apart. I always got that vibe that had he been here in 2012, that team was – this is me personally. I thought that was a 10-win team. Tyler Wilson's back, Niall Davis, Dennis Johnson, Kobe Hamilton. uh, The list goes on. A lot of experience, guys back on the offensive line. That looked like a pretty well-pieced together team, but what was important was he was the X factor. Petrino was the X factor. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think they would have had a, a great season, and, and I know they disappointed the players. Uh, there have been several stories this week, and DJ can speak to this certainly better than I can. That uh, he asked for personal responsibility from a bunch of his players and demanded that, and didn't want to hear any excuses, but then went out and and did uh, you know what he did that ended up losing his job. So I think uh, while he had great respect for him as a football coach, they lost some respect for him, uh, you know, as a man in doing what he did, but obviously he demands excellence on the field. Uh, yeah. it, watching one of his practices was uh, uh, interesting in that uh, if the defense made a play, uh, that was going to be, that was going to be an issue with him and, and Willie Robinson, the defensive coordinator. I mean, he wanted to see his offense succeed. He wanted his players to have the opposite offense succeed in defense. Uh, we'll get around to that sooner or later. You know? Yeah. Defense took a back seat. There's no mm-hmm. doubt. We'll, I always feel bad for Willie Robinson. Good luck trying to catch up to that offense. I mean, they're going to score. It wasn't uncommon, no matter who the opponent was, they're going to score in six, seven plays. Mm-hmm. You know, fast drives. And it, that, was, that was before the era. It was right in the beginning of the era. The RPO really having an, an impact on college football. Of course, Gus did what Gus did, and he brought his game along one way or another at a couple different places. But I felt like Arkansas. They they had the guy. They had they had the guy. You talk about X's and O's, uh, and then you you remove him from the equation. They just weren't the same team in, in anywhere close to it. And then of course you were led to then John L. Smith. Were you in the room with the smile comment? Were you there when he did that? Yes. In fact, I looked at a couple other guys. And said, what the did he just say? I'll never forget that. University of Alabama's team, baby. Say what now? Said the University of Alabama's team, baby. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was another one of his smell of props. Yeah. He uh he was something. It was that time, that era was so wild. And of course, you move into the Bielema era after that, and it felt like things were going in the right direction. And of course, we know how that unfolded. But what we gained out of that though was Sam Pittman. I think uh, mm-hmm. his exposure to Fayetteville. Of course, he knew about Fayetteville, but uh, I think that ultimately led to Arkansas having him now. So now that we're we're all kind of caught up on that, on, on what was, let's talk about what will be. Arkansas taking on Missouri State. Let's just start off with the guy that pops off on film. Uh, they got a pretty good quarterback in Shelly. You, t- you talk about molding to what you have. Well, he's got a guy that can do some damage uh, on the ground and through the air in, uh, in Shelly, their quarterback, number yeah. three. Yeah. Uh, I think thrown for 568 yards also has been a running threat. Uh, as you said, he, he handles their RPOs, so Arkansas will have to play assignment football. Uh, that's something you have to do any any time. But when you're especially playing an offensive genius uh, head coach, then you really have to because you know that all this week uh, and maybe even a couple weeks, he's been sitting back and diagnosing Arkansas secondary especially. Uh, you know, I know he's going to try to stay away from wherever Drew Sanders is at. Uh, Drew Sanders is suddenly, uh, uh, you know, somebody that, that you're going to have to game plan for. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, that's, that's going to be not only the case this weekend, but here on out. But I think he'll see some, uh, he'll see some uh, weaknesses in that secondary. He's going to do his best to, to try to, uh, Try to take advantage of those. We will see. It will be much better for Arkansas if Miles Slusher uh, can play. 
We'll see if he does. Uh, as you well know, from going out to practice, he hasn't been there yet. Or at least he hasn't been there when the media has been there is how I'm going to go about it. If he's, they brought him in after that, yeah, that may be the case. Uh, but uh, he'd be much better. But I do think uh, that you have a situation where at least you have Latavius Brinney and, and Dwight McLaughlin, guys who have played in SEC games, who have played in big situations, who have made plays. They, I mean, they've also given up a few too. But uh, you much better off with those guys then let's say you would have been trying to put in a freshman or whatever for uh yeah. for Jalen catalog and now you can allow those freshmen to come along which i think are going to be great players down the line this guy talking about exploiting arkansas secondary and and of course yeah we didn't see slusher um monday or tuesday and like you said we didn't see slusher that doesn't mean that he wasn't a participant in one fashion or another uh, in in practice but um what do you make of of the Hudson Clark comment by Sam Pittman talking about moving him to middle safety? Did you, was that something yeah. that kind of surprised you a little or a little bit? But he, I think he feels better about his quarterback choices than he does his depth at safety. You know, there are so many people that can fit into certain pigeonholes as a defensive back, and they're better in one spot than the other. Of course, these days you play with the nickel pretty much all the time. So, yeah. you know, Jaden Johnson has really uh, come along there, and, and, you know, I think he's going to be a force. So I think he's looking for what the, the best things he, he can do. And uh, Hudson Clark is very experienced. Uh, he's been in the Arkansas and Odom system for, you know, several years now. I think his coverage ability uh, might be better off at safety. Uh, so I'm, while I'm, I'm a little bit surprised to hear that, I do think they're saying, oh, let's get our best ones on the field. And that's, uh, you know, I think that's what they're trying to do. Certainly seems to be the case. I, I've, I've said before, um, tack some weight on him. He's, he's behind Catalan. He was the second best tackler in that secondary. He's yeah. not afraid of contact. And he, and, and he has good technique. You know, he's limited he sometimes does. athletically, and when he does get burned, uh, he becomes the, the whipping boy for, you know, the fans and all that. But if you go to pro football focus and, and look at the grades, he grades out better than anybody. And I, yeah. I think there are many fans who would find that hard to believe, but they only think about the plays that he's given up instead of mm -hmm. the ones that he made. Yep. And Otis – Otis, listen. I get, I get called pretty critical. Some, or I'm told that I'm pretty critical, and especially when it comes to the secondary. But that's mostly because I can only, I can only tell you what I see. And and Hudson does, he does get beat. I mean, he, he does. We haven't seen it as bad this year. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited to see if they do move him over, and then, uh, you know, kind of get a different look at who's playing. You know cornerback one corner two boundary versus you know whatever uh well, Keon parker is is uh, an impetus of making this move the, the, yeah. you know, the young man who certainly hasn't gotten uh, coach Pittman's attention and, and the, yeah. when your head coach tells the the media at a press conference i think he should play more well he's about to play more yeah yeah kind of no question uh, no brainer at that point i think he's going to play more this is this is the game and um this is the game. If you're going to make some moves and you want to you want to see it on film against an opponent, this is this is the week to do it. Not saying that they should overlook uh, Missouri State at all, but let's be honest in terms of the talent that they're up against. This is this is definitely the uh, the lowest tier level of talent. Now, it is Bobby Petrino, so we we all know you got to keep that in mind. Uh, Maybe the best offensive coach with the, the not as good a talent, although I think we should discuss the talent at Missouri State didn't start there. Most of it didn't start transfers. there. Transfers. accumulated the, the, the two transfers from big-time schools that you never would have thought would have ended up at Missouri State. So you got to give him credit for that. Uh, you know, I guess he's out there actually doing some recruiting. Yeah. <laughs> uh Probably Missouri State fans. I know they don't have a large media. I think they've got like one guy that covers, but I'm sure he's pretty, he's staying busy because they have talking about keeping up with the reports on recruiting. 
It's something like 22 transfers, I think, over the course of two years or something. I mean, that's not insane, but that's still really high. And these, like you said, these are kids coming from all over the country. Some they of them. Were, yeah, they were one in 10 the year before he got there. Uh, yeah. He was hired by a guy who, who actually uh, is, uh, grew up a Razorback fan and is now the president up there. Uh, yep. who has made it clear he didn't have any qualms about uh, hiring him. He thinks that he's learned from his past transgressions and that he's, you know, fully focused on football. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, there's no, uh, if you read the story this week from Chris Lowe, there's no plaques or trophies or anything adorning his office. Now it's just pictures of grandkids. Yeah. And that, I mean, it certainly seems like he's okay. Well, let, let's just call it then. You and I, let, let's call it what he did down at the Little Rock Touchdown Club. Me a couple. You think it was sincere? Yeah, I do. I do. Okay. And the reason I think it was sincere because uh, he took an unbelievable amount of criticism from Ooh. people not only that were fans, but from people that he respected nationally. And, uh, you know, uh, that was quite a quite a scene. I'll never yeah. forget being in that press conference with him with the neck brace. And uh, I had some inside information on that because I had somebody, knew somebody involved in the investigation, so I knew he was lying. Uh, but that, it, you know, I think it was reiterated this week. Jeff Long said, don't do that press conference. But he wanted to do it because he, again, if you'll ride around, on a motorcycle, with a blind on the back, without a helmet, you believe you're bulletproof. Obviously, he wasn't, and uh, he held on as long as he could to say there was not anybody on the back of the motorcycle. But when it was going to be fully vetted, fully reported, you know, he, he got it out there. So. It was. He again, get, was it's important to remember he didn't get fired because he had an affair. There have been coaches during my 35 years who have slept with people other than their wives. That I've known about that no. I did, did report them because I'm not, you know, we're not PMZ and all that. But when it became a legality issue of hiring her, you know, that was a problem. And then after the 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 alleged crash, uh, you had uh, him lying, 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 yeah. and continuing to lie, and yeah. uh, you know, it pissed off a bunch of people who were enjoying the success. But you know, in the end. You, you've got to tell the truth after the fact. You, many people can take a lot of stuff, but, you know, don't tell. And, and, and we know that Jeff Long was starting to get pressure on himself, and we know how that ended up down the line. So, God, you know, that was, an, that was an era we'll look back on and, and just say it was interesting. It was a train wreck. It ended up being a train wreck. It, it all seemed so great. Snoop Dogg smoking blunts on campus and everything's all good. Arkansas's winning ball games. Who cares? Ryan Mallett, former five-star quarterback, transfers into town and all the, oh, the the legendary. I think one of my favorite things to come out of that is the anybody got a scantron for Ryan Mallett. That like that is legendary. The head uh, coach all- at Whitehall now. He's doing a good job this year. He I mean, is. I yeah. A lot and and uh, you know, like I, I guess I was telling somebody, I've literally known him since he was born, and uh, uh, I'm proud of what he's doing right now. He's he's doing a good job, man. He's he's one of those. You, I love seeing those guys that maybe kind of had a bumpy ride along the way. Oh, by the way, he was an NFL starter. I mean, it's not all been bad for Ryan. Of course, he won a lot of games here as well. But just talking about the Jeff Long, the debacle that just in the ultimate train wreck. I mean, that's in the past. It is what it is. But it's something important to talk about because. Petrino is in town, and this kind of brings all that back up to the surface a little bit. Um, and while, and while, while we're talking about Jeff Long, I just sure. want to, his daughter, Christina, is a member of the, the, the Arkansas media now. She does a tremendous mm-hmm. job covering the Razorbacks, and I think she yeah. deserves a lot of credit for being able to come back into this situation. There have been times when we've been in the press box and somebody didn't know that she was his daughter and has made comments. Uh, yeah. But I, I just want to toss that out there. I think she's done a tremendous job being part of the media, uh, being very uh, successful in what she did, 
does. And doing it in a situation that could have been a pressure cooker for her, really. Or, or I know I would have uh, turned around and told some people what I thought, you know, if they were yeah. Like that. yeah. I don't Yeah. You ain't talking about my pops who's, uh, who's been known to come across these YouTube comment sections. Good old Arky 56. You'll see him on a war machine video every once in a while down below in the comment section, picking fights. Not really picket fights, but having hot takes, and then they kind of pile on top of it. I'm like, Dad, you got to stop. Yeah, I don't know how. Yeah, she does a great job. You're right. She does. She's really good at her job, and that would be tough. But his, um, it all came kind of crashing down. It felt like Jeff Long, when you talk about a guy who could raise money, what he did with the Razorback Foundation was great. Again, it was all like it felt like such icing on the cake he brought in mike anderson did a, did a really good job it's also kind of hard to put all that on him you know he's not the head coach um i mean you could say there might have been some red flags there with petrino some of the rumors that came out of what happened when he was the oc at auburn and the stuff that happened at louisville and then the way of course he ultimately left atlanta there was a lot of i mean jamal anderson was on that team former razorback defensive end first round draft pick he was on I that team it was uh but uh, the whole dogfighting thing, and that he went from having a generational quarterback, a superstar in the NFL, yeah, to not being able to do what he wanted to offensively. That's why, with three games mm -hmm. left in the season, when Arkansas came calling, he left out the door and left them notes on their uh, chairs in the locker room, which is yeah. he just said this week is one of the things he really regrets. So, we'll, we'll, you and I, we've got DJ Williams coming up here in a little bit. Let me let me finish this off uh, with uh, with you with your take on this game. How do you see this unfolding? I know that's a loaded question, but how do you see this unfolding? And should Arkansas just blow these guys out simply because it's Petrino or or does Brett or excuse me Brett? Oh my gosh, does Sam kind of let off the the accelerator in the fourth quarter? How do you see this playing out? Well, I think that uh, Missouri State will have some success early because he will scheme uh, certainly his first, you know, several series, and he will have worked on, you know, Arkansas's weakness. I think Barry Odom and them, them will make an adjustment if they need to. Uh, there is uh, there is a vast – is that the right way to say it? There is a – Arkansas has more talent on the field this year uh, than Missouri State. But Missouri State's not as uh, – they do have talent. It's come in from other schools. Yeah. Uh, you know, guys who, who played at other schools for a long time and did get their chance or did get their chance and decided to make the move. So I think it's going to be close early. But I do think that if there is not a, a solid, very, uh, I don't want to call it a route, but if there's not a, an easy getaway toward the end of the ball game, something will have gone terribly wrong. And there will be a lot of nervousness in the in the stands at, at Arkansas Saturday. But I do think that there's no way that Missouri State should beat Arkansas, but there was no way Appalachian State sh should have beaten Texas A&M because they lost, they gave up 63 points the week before to North Carolina. No way that uh, Texas A&M, uh, you know, should have lost. But uh, it happens every Saturday. You better go out and you better be ready to play. This is an opportunity for guys that have not been on the field yet or have not been on the field as much for them to get an opportunity to play. And that includes maybe the three freshmen wide receivers. You know, I assume they're going to play in a, you know, four games and keep the red shirts. This might be the one, you know, about be some one where you can get them some snaps. So but yeah. yeah, Arkansas should win or we're going to have quite a show next week. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. Um, Oh my gosh, what a story that would be. Petrino walks into Fayetteville. I know someone's going to accuse us of starting this weekend off with bad juju, but I mean, listen, college football these days is crazy. The transfer portal, the NIL stuff, it's crazy. It's it's become I think it's gotten even more difficult to predict. Honestly, it's not as predictable as it once was, which is great because that means there's more parity. Uh there was one question. I I can't let you out of here without at least answering a question from the from the uh chat here uh but, 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 but the spotter stand wants to know what do you think the true ceiling for this team is i see 11 wins as possible uh wins as possible with how good they have looked there's a lot of hype right now with arkansas being in the top 10 folks we even had a couple of riders at espn put arkansas in their in their 14 playoff dudley is is 11 wins really is that the ceiling do you think 
that ceiling's expanding. Every, everything would have to go right. I still uh, am not ready to lock in the fact that they would beat either Alabama or uh, BYU in that, that uh, two-game stretch there. The I, I, I think that they have the opportunity to be really good. Uh, you know, I'm worried about the secondary, as, as everybody else is. You know, maybe it'll play itself out. But the true, the true ceiling, I still believe there's going to be around nine wins or something like that. But they, they, you know, each one they play, if they get better, and and you look at some of the other teams besides Alabama, who obviously the only team it looks like to me that can stop Alabama is themselves, and they did a really good job of it last week with the penalties and different things like that. Uh, I'm not ready to go anywhere near the playoff. Uh, I'm not ready to go anywhere near. Uh, you know, calling this a special team of all time, but they are doing that. Th- you can only win two games if you play two games, and they've done that. At times, they've looked really good. At times, not. Uh, let's ju- let let's get through the the next three games, and then then you know, I think that'll tell us. Because I think Cincinnati's pretty good, but not as good as they were. I think South Carolina had shots to beat uh, to beat Arkansas deep. Spencer Rattler in the press conference said. Uh, he wanted to make sure he got it over the Arkansas defense back. Well, he did, and his receivers, you know. And if he had hit some of those, you know, you you get a, a real tight game in the fourth quarter. So I'm not, not ready to jump on board fully yet, but I like what I see, and I think there's the opportunity to, to get better, and that's what you try to do each week. One more question here, and I agree with that too, by the way. I think this could have been a different conversation uh, had he connected on even just a couple of those throws. Not saying that it changes the outcome, but it could have, I don't know, I feel like we'd be having a little bit different discussion, and we probably wouldn't be seeing as much hype as we've seen had those gone through, uh, or had they been completed. Are we going to see Dominic Johnson this weekend, or is that a game-time decision? Simply up to Dominic Johnson. Uh, I think he's going to play. I don't see which would, what would keep him from playing this weekend uh, other than just his mentality, and i got to believe He's ready to go now. You know, I haven't had any personal discussions with him, but Coach Pittman keeps making it very clear that Dominique has been cleared medically. Now he's just got to be cleared mentally, and he's got to do that himself. Yeah. Well, he looked good. I saw him Monday and Tuesday. Much rather have him play this week and be and have had have taken some hits and done some things before they go next weekend to to Arlington. Yeah. Because at the very least, A and M is still a physical defense. I mean, say what you want about their offense and what's going on there. Their defense is physical. They've got some speed. So get him used to, you know, contact this week. Doesn't mean he's got to carry the ball fifteen times, which he wouldn't anyways because of rocket. But yeah, get him used to contact, full speed. Give him a few carries. You Dudley, think, you think yell leader practice is going to be filmed the next couple of weeks at Texas A and M? Probably shouldn't do that, should they? Yeah, it's true. That's that's true. Well, I appreciate you uh, coming with us this morning, Dudley. I will uh, I will see you at the game on Saturday, my friend. Sounds good. We'll we'll have our normal seats there. That's right. We'll be there. You and I, and now Otis, will be up there with us. Finally, the three of us. It's a party. That's right. All right, Dudley. Thanks a lot, man. You bet. Later. All right, we have uh, coming up next here. We have um, well. Let's get rid of that. We've got a we've got a special guest. I told you guys in the uh, Discord earlier. Someone did get it right, but I said we've got someone coming on. It's pretty special. Former Razorback. It took a while, but someone finally got it. Let's bring him on. It is the former Arkansas Razorback tight end, Mister DJ Williams. DJ, how you doing, man? Doing good, man. How are you? Doing all right. Right on. Nice little day. Feels good out. You know, not too bad. Right not bad at all. Not too bad. So you were the very first Mackey Award recipient for the Razorbacks. I was. And that happened under the guy we're going to play this weekend, Bobby yeah. Petrino. Can you uh, – well, first off, thank you so much for taking time out of your morning to be here with us. Yeah. Um, we do appreciate it. I wanted to ask you, and, and we've got about – 20 25 minutes um unless you've got to be somewhere sooner you just let me know yep but uh i want to ask you what what that transition was like with when petrino took over and, and of course talking about that 2010 season how special that was for you um it was difficult uh him uh, coming over a lot of players on that team you know you get accustomed to a certain 
way of going about things, a certain culture, um, certain expectations. Um, and especially when it comes to recruiting aspect, you know, a lot of these players, that's where I'm a fan of opening things up just in case something happens as far as some promises aren't fulfilled. But, you know, Houston, that was my guy, you know, and uh, I yeah. loved him. I loved his brother, Danny, that whole coaching staff, Coach Shebess. I mean, you had the good relationships and good recruiting, and that's ultimately why I wanted to go to the University of Arkansas outside of it being in my own backyard, you know. And so, uh, obviously, a lot of people who are familiar with the uh, Houston Nut days know he was the ultimate players coach. I mean, primetime speech. I mean, I tell people all the time, if he really set me down, he could probably talk me into robbing a bank. You know, it's just how he is. You know what I mean? He's, <laughs> he's just so motivating. You'll be like, man, I, th I think it's a bad idea. But after listening to you, I think we can do this, you know. And so he was that type of coach and that type of motivator. Always had your back, always asking about this and that. And uh, just one of the boys, the ultimate players coach. And so when that switch happened, man, you go from one extreme to the complete opposite. And we heard about Petrino before he even got there about his escapades at Atlanta. Uh, yeah. his time at um, uh, Louisville. Um, and you hear about Brian Brom, quarterback, kind of saying he's the hardest coach I've ever played with, but I'm glad I played for him. And we're like, man, what does that mean? You know, we learned real quick exactly what that meant. So that was a very tough transition for me because, um, you know, I just – he came in. I was I didn't take too kindly to him at first, and a lot of people don't even know I was trying to transfer. I was trying to go to Old Miss and go with uh, Houston Nutt. And talking to Houston and talking to Bobby about that whole process, you know, and it wasn't like it is nowadays. You would have to sit out a season, um, maybe two if it's in conference. And even uh, Houston was like, take your time. I know this is tough. This is just part of the business. I know we have these relationships and made all these promises. Give it the uh, give it spring ball or camp or whatever. And then, you know, see how it goes. And then Petrino threw me the ball like every single play. I was like, okay, I can get down with this. You know what I mean? Okay. And I, I can deal with this hard-nosed guy all up in my face all the time to the point to where you're just, you know, ready to just sometimes walk off that field, you know. But you start seeing the results, and it, it's just hard to deny. And not just with me, but with everyone on that football team. And, and it just really weeded out the people – who wanted to be successful or not. You know, there was no room for med for meteorocracy at all in that program. And um, now that being said, we were blessed with a very special group of in-state talent um, when Petrino yeah. was there, and he had weapons to work with. I mean, with that type of offensive mind, and you got a group of guys that are going to stick together no matter what, and they just happen to be some of the best in the country at what they do. I mean, that's why that team was just set up for success. And so – it was definitely a very interesting transition. Uh, I'm very glad I stuck around and I was a part of it. And me not seeing eye to eye with Petrino, I would say quickly changed. And it came from a matter of I don't really like this guy to I respect this guy, you know. And uh, it was a big life lesson, not just for me, but I think for everyone on that team about like change. Sometimes it's hard, but if you don't want to go, you know, to Austin, Texas and lose 52 to seven, then change is necessary, you know. Was was that the same kind of attitude with the rest of the players? I mean, guys that were there from Houston Nut in that in that era, was that the same kind of attitude? Like, I don't know about this guy, but hey, we're oh yeah, the, the, the guys that were there now, like you know, Jarius Wright, Joe Adams, Greg Childs, that whole little uh, they didn't know no better. That's all they knew. You know, they never got to experience Houston. Nutt. They got recruited by Tim Horton and Houston and Danny Nut, but as far as what college football is like. You know, they had no clue. They was like, oh, this is normal. All the rest of us are like, this ain't right. You know what I mean? And so uh, <laughs> the guys that were there beforehand, it was tougher to transition. Um, but like I said, we just had a – Petrino had a very interesting way of becoming kind of this role of a head coach to where you, it almost forces you to just lean on your teammates and be like, man, well, we got to pull together. You know, I got your back. You got my back. We know this is going to be hard. We know this is going to be tough. Let's just put in this work and keep it going, you know, because there's no other way around it. And so he did a really good job of really making us a closer team. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but he really did. <laughs> it really was. That was his, that was his plan at the, this whole time. I'm yeah, be, I get it I'm, now. I'm going to be a huge uh, – I'm, I'm going to be in their faces nonstop, and they're going to band together. That's right. And, and, it, and it happened. It did happen. It did. Let me ask you, too, did you get – during your recruiting process um, – 
I know there's a whole backstory there, but Houston Nutt, did you get the uh, there's only one Razorback speech from Houston? Oh, you already know that. He said, he said <laughs> DJ, let me tell you this, man. DJ, come on now. You know, across the country, there's many, many places. You know, there's a lot of lions, tigers, and bears. I'm going to tell you one thing. There's only one Razorback. And then he would break that down to what that actually meant is, you know, but beyond it just sounding good. <laughs> a little lot from Wizard of Oz, but – uh. He is true. I mean, the support around this state, I mean, every other place you go to, you know, if you go to Oklahoma, the Oklahoma State, or is it Oklahoma? They even got Tulsa in the mix. You go to Texas, they got so many teams there. And beyond college teams, they got professional sports that, you know, maybe three or four or five different professional sports in one state. And there's a fan base just split up across the whole thing. But here in Arkansas, it is it, you know, and I don't mean to offend any Arkansas State fans, UCA fans, you know. Uh, Russell, be careful. We'll you come after you. You know, but I hate to say it, but a lot of people from Jonesboro, a lot of people from Conway, a lot of people from Russellville are making their way up to Fayetteville on a Saturday. That's absolutely true, yeah. And those Arkansas State fans, they're, they may be few, but yeah. boy, they get mouthy on Ooh, Twitter. Oh, man, they're on it, man. I, I work with a few of them, and you would just, you know, it's just <laughs> – it, I mean, you have to appreciate the loyalty, and I, I had a I had a very very bad take on our game day show last week, and I will say I am interested to see in 2025 when Arkansas plays Arkansas State uh, at War Memorial, and uh, I, I hated the fact that this game is even going to happen. Arkansas literally has everything to lose, nothing to gain, and it's a win win for a state. You know what I mean? It really and, is, uh, yeah. And the whole aspect of saying, well, keep the money in the state. Let's not pay these other teams. Well, if A-State didn't have us on the schedule, they would go get paid by Miami or somebody. You know what I mean? So the mm-hmm. money is all the same. But uh, I hate to admit it, but we talked about rivalries for University of Arkansas. And I know Arkansas fans hate Texas. Texas week is huge, you know. Hate LSU. LSU week is huge. But as a player, we always used to just be like, man, they really don't care about us. You know, we, we hate them. Texas mm-hmm. – could give a, they could care less about Arkansas on their schedule. Mm-hmm. LSU is the same way. There's only one school I could see out there where there could be a mutual, like, I can't stand those guys and they can't stand us. And it, unfortunately, it's Arkansas State. But Yeah, I've said the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the only thing that makes sense. And I guess we'll see with that turnout at War Memorial. You know, that game's going to be nuts. You know what I mean? But, if it still happens at War Memorial, I kind of wonder if oh, yeah. by, by then – if we're not completely backed out and playing that game in Fayetteville. Yeah. I don't know. I say that, but I've said that for like several years. I'm, I'm kind of surprised. Let me ask you. So wait, you're from Little Rock. How do you feel about that stadium debate? It, it, do you feel like they need to keep it in Little Rock? Keep the tradition? I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep it real. I'm, I'm extremely biased. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> um, and so I, I take that, you know, into consideration. And when it was described to me what it was like playing in Little Rock, it was Houston Nutt describing it to me. So I'm over here like, oh, this place is amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> if anyone else would have described, uh, described it to me, but it was spot on, man. There is nothing like, and I, I've been obviously to many games in Fayetteville. Um, it's not necessarily the stadium. It's the people uh, yeah. here in Little Rock. And when you pull up to that uh, stadium coming up Markham, and you see a sea, like you don't even see the golf course because there's so many people. I mean, hell, 80% of them can't even get into the stadium. They're there just for the party. And they line that bus, and you can hear them hitting that bus. I mean, it is a different kind of feeling. Like, these people in Little Rock, it's a different breed. It's rowdy. And, and I would think anyone else in Northwest Arkansas would agree, but, like, them Little Rock folk are a little different. And so as far as atmosphere and uh, environment and, you know, as players, and you can, may think it's cliche or not, it's just a different sense of pride, you know, when you see these guys – because, you know, Northwest Arkansas is flooding in money, you know, and I know Little Rock has good money, too. But for the most part, there's no comparison in the type of people up there and people here. And so when you roll up to these games and you see people that would never have the opportunity to get close to a Razorback football game. And it's just like this is our home. It's just different. You know what I mean? Now, I don't know if I'm saying that because I'm from Little Rock. I get it. But at the same time, yes. For a home game, it would be nice not to travel two and a half hours on a bus. You know what I mean? So yeah. disadvantages and advantages. I've I've said for years, and I said this on uh, my other on my other show. Northwest Northwest Arkansas. I'm from here, born and raised in Fayetteville. I've worked at Sam's Club Corporate, so I've mm-hmm. been around that part of the state and those people. A yep. lot of transplants. 
a oh, lot yeah. of people from outside the state. And so the I feel like the diehard fans, they're still here. They're still yep. – they're probably in Farmington now. They're in Goshen. Mm-hmm. They're in Lowell, whatever. But I've always felt like outside of NWA are some of the most hardcore Razorback fans oh, yeah. you will see anywhere. They're oh, in man, Jonesboro. No, they're in Central Arkansas. They're down in Arkadelphia. That's right, man. I've Come just always – I've lived here my entire life. I've gone to many games in Little Rock. I've tailgated both places. It's just a mm-hmm. different environment. Yeah, you know, there. you know, Northwest Arkansas is bougie compared to Little Rock. <laughs> you know, you go to Northwest yeah. Arkansas, they got some really dope tailgates. I'm telling you, I'm like, dang, this is fancy, you know. But I need a little bit of that just rugged old smoker with rust on it. That's people, right. you know, questionable people in that tailgate, but they're a good time. You know, I like that aspect too. Yeah, nothing well, like nothing like it down there in Little Rock, no. man. I, I've never been on the golf course though. I've never been. I've tailgated down there uh, twice. I've never been on the golf course. Man, it's a blast. I mean, and you talk about a place where color don't matter, status don't matter. It, the only thing that matters is that Razorback, and it, and it's Them special, hogs. man. It is special. Them hogs. I oh, will yeah. say, I've been doing uh, tailgate tours. I did a tailgate tour for the Cincinnati game. We're going to be out there Saturday, myself and our photographer John. Yeah, uh, I will say the tailgating scene has improved in Fayetteville. It has. Uh, it's it's still not Little Rock level, but it's getting yeah. better. Well, you know, we travel. I, I travel to every game, and so I see tailgating to the max at every single place. And I wish um, our administration or whoever is over it would kind of relax on these tailgating rules and these tailgating spots that they're just charging out of the wazoo for. I mean, yeah. I've talked to a lot of donors who tailgated for years, and it said – one, they keep pushing us back, you know. I love to look at the uh, parking lot in front of the stadium, and it used to just be packed with tailgates. That's not a thing anymore. They're kind of pushing it back, and they're you know, they're charging more for it as well. People are just like, man, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. So yeah. I've been to places. You go to LSU. You go to Bama. It's just like a free-for-all, you know. And it's like <laughs> they say, don't worry about this, that. We just want you all as close as possible and to be crazy. And yeah. the, I mean, so we, we, we got some room for – for improvement when it comes to the tailgating scene. I just wish they would kind of lower the uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? The qualifications that people would need in order to tailgate and just let them loose. Let them loose. Let them yeah. do their thing. Get wild. Yeah. yeah, that's what they're there for. So let's let's talk about this matchup really quick this weekend. Um, I don't know. I, I've caught a little bit of what they do. They've got this quarterback, DJ. I'm not going to lie, man. This dude uh, – looks pretty good Run, yeah. running an rpo which is different for petrino yeah. and you would know that better than anybody yeah. this dude can get it done um shelly is his name where's number three give me your thoughts on on their offense and how it differs maybe from when you played there uh you know being a Mackey award winner and and, mm-hmm. and being a part of a great offense in 2010 can you tell us kind of the difference between what they do now and what they did then and Maybe yeah. talk about that quarterback a little bit. Yeah, he's uh, Petrino's just going to work with what he has. And uh, he was very good about not asking people to do something who knew they were not going to be good at. He looks at his talent. He looks at his roster. And he says, this is best fit for this team. And he has the offensive genius to make it work within his scheme. Because, you know, he, he he's a lot of people thought we just aired it out when he was here. We were a very balanced offense. Uh, you were, yeah. We had great running backs. Now Davis, Dennis Johnson, Ronnie Wingo, Broderick Green, and they all uh, got in that work. You know, it's just sometimes it's flashier when you see, you know, the Greg Childs, the Kobe Hamilton, Jarius Wright, Joe Adams. They're out there just doing their thing as well, but very balanced offense. And, you know, he's going to incorporate that in everything that he does, you know, depending on the defensive scheme and, like I said, his personnel. But – you know, you talk about the RPO, the perfect example is when uh, he went back to Louisville and uh, had Lamar Jackson, you know, and yeah. he says, this guy's a talent, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, Mallet doesn't have that ability at all. You know what I mean? So uh, he he figures out the personnel, what best fits them. And when I tell y'all, when we'd be in those meeting rooms and we'd be at practice and, you know, he would uh, the scout, he would have sheets drawn up for the scout team. Where's the camera? Yeah, sheets drawn up for the scout team. And uh, it would everything that they would do. And I'm over here in my mind, like thinking, you know, we'd run a play. If it wasn't right, we'd get back up with the ball. And he says, no, defenders stand right here. And I'm over here thinking, there's no telling where that defender is going to be in the game. Let's just go with the flow. And I'll be damned. I mean, every single play, like the first play against Ole Miss, he said, this was going to happen. It's going to be a, a cross. This dude's going to drop this linebacker. That's the only person you got to be. And it was, as I'm running, I was like, this is exactly what happened in practice. I mean, he is – 
there's no telling how much he watches film and picks up on tendencies. Uh, we had another play against Old Miss another year about understanding the technique of a defensive lineman just based off what we do. You know, he's teaching us their tendencies and their reaction based off what we do. So we would use it against them. And so when I look at Arkansas on the defensive side of the ball, especially with our linebackers, when it comes to bringing pressure, it seems like they have a responsibility to somewhat have the running back in somewhat of a man zone type skin. And if the running back stays in a block, then they engage and rush. I see it all the time. And Petrino was very good at spotting that. And that's where a lot of my over the middle catches came from was bait. Like I'm blocking, wait till they engage. And then I just slip out completely untouched. And so he, he sees all those tendencies and, you know, I do think we're going to win this football game, you know, but I know Petrino was thinking, man, if I just had a guy that could maybe run faster than a four, four, or maybe an offensive lineman that weighed over two seventy, <laughs> I'd be very nervous about this game um, against our defense. What do you what do you make of their quarterback as far as just a it, it, his place in this offense? You talk about Petrino, kind of you know working with the with the with the roster that he has. D mm -hmm. Does he impress you a lot in, in in film? Do you kind of? Oh no doubt, no doubt at all. Um, you look at his ability to be balanced and decision making. You know, and the thing about decision making, um, you have to give hats out to him about making the right read. You know, making a couple gutsy throws, being very competitive. You know. Um, Petrino really doesn't have much margin for error when it comes to his patience. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I've heard. So I've yeah, heard. When you see quarterbacks in that type of offense, you know, push the boundaries, um, it's a cool thing because he's very confident because he knows if I do make a wrong read, I'm going to go get chewed out on the sideline, you know, but just the ability to push those limits and take those risks says a lot about him. And once again, Petrino has him out there for a reason, you know, but. And I don't, I don't care if you're the best player in the world. If you do anything wrong, you're going to hear about it as soon as you step off the field. Well, let's flip let's flip the switch a little bit. Let's talk about Arkansas's offense for just a second. Uh, Kendall, so far, we, you, they've played two games. Obviously, they're 2-0. and The offense looks like they're clicking on another level, and that's yeah. without Traylon Burks, and that's without any receiver really standing out. What? How would you assess their games over these last – over these, or how would you assess their play over these last two games? I mean, they just have the ability now to – control you know the the tempo of the game control the whole pace and just because they're so dominant in running the football they could run almost every play if they wanted to yeah. um obviously they know they're going to come across teams where there's going to be defensive linemen and linebackers that's not possible so i really do feel like they are really trying to establish being balanced as much as possible because they know those teams are coming now uh, if they wanted to week one in this week they could have ran every single time and been just fine and so it's very cool to not only see that, but the development and the trust that uh, Browse is now putting in KJ. Um, they do try to dial up some big shots. It's just like the defense kind of, you know, kind of has been doing fairly good about stopping some of those trick plays that you would see or those <laughs> plays where they set up for a bigger one. I saw one play yeah. last week where Trade Knox and another receiver, they were acting like they were blocking for the running back who was doing a little bubble route. Usually DBs try to beat that block and then Trey and then they slipped and tried to go deep, but the DBs didn't bite. And old KJ Jefferson probably would have just let it fly and hope for the best. But now he's making that the smart reads. He's understanding, okay, I don't have to score a touchdown every play. Then he would just dump it off to the back, pick up four yards. And so that just goes to show the growth in him, you know, the communication between him and Browse and um, them still trying to push the initiative. I'm still waiting for those big over the top bombs that we see every once in a while. We did see one, but it was dropped, you know. But mm, once we Lander. get that clicking, oh, my gosh. I mean, the, the offense is going to be something special. Now, I still don't think we've been battle-tested with the defensive front yet. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, yeah, because these guys are not real big. They're linebackers. KJ outweighs their linebackers. They don't yeah. have a 300-pound defensive uh, lineman in interior. They got a couple of guys that are close, think like 290 Mm -hmm. um, but these aren't SEC guys. And like Dudley mentioned earlier, these are transfers, though. Some of these guys did play for bigger schools, so that is yeah. something to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, and I think that, too, goes into maybe the way the they may go ahead and try to establish the run, get a nice little lead, but they know who's coming up, and they know they have to get this receiving core. They have to at least get one guy to be that playmaker. And, you know, so I would expect to see quite a bit of that in the attempt of establishing a threat you know, when it comes to the deep ball. Yeah. 
Well, you mentioned Trey Knox a minute ago, and then someone in chat also had a really good question. Uh, Austin wants to know, if I get it to pull up here, how has he liked Trey Knox transitioning to tight end? So his progress, we know he moved from wide receiver last year to tight end, which, by the way, if I heard that right, he actually went to the staff and volunteered to play tight end. I, I don't know if I heard that wrong or not. Mm -hmm. um, I did, yeah, I didn't know that. I think um, – no, that's a – I might have read that somewhere. Hopefully it wasn't on a message board, but <laughs> pretty, I'm pretty sure I've heard that from a legit But I source. wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I've had uh, I've got to talk to Trey a few times. And uh, just his personality, man, and his attitude obviously jumps off um, the sheet when it looks like, man, this guy just keeps grinding, waiting for his opportunity. He comes in just highly touted. His freshman year was Trey Knox this, Trey Knox that. Burps yeah. and just exploded, and he kind of disappeared. Some people would say a disappointment, you know, and so to weather that storm and then come out and do what he's doing now and putting on the weight that he put on. I mean, it is when he lines up in the slot, I almost forget he did play receiver because he's fast. He, he, he knows how to run routes um, as a college receiver would because he, he was one, is one still. Mm -hmm. But I really look at him in the interior um, line. And I've been so impressed with his willingness to get in there and block and be physical. Yeah. You know, it's almost like he's more comfortable blocking down there than he is out in space trying to block like a, a DB in a slot. And so that's very special to see. And uh, his second touchdown of the year when um, he caught it, ran from about 30 yards out. I was just like, yeah. whoo. He looks Scott's fast. Like that. He's fast now. They almost forgot yeah. how fast he is. So Yeah, he was a – he was a high four four guy out of oh, high yeah, school, if I remember moving. right. He still got some. He still got some zoom in there. That, that, yeah. that was fun to see for sure. I don't. I don't want to put you on the spot with this, but do you see him possibly as a guy that could play at the next level? Do you? Do I you mean, think he has he has the frame and the size. Uh, if not drafted, he'll be put on a team. I mean, he's just too physically gifted. You know yeah. what I mean? And they'll figure it out there. You know what I mean? If it's a if it's a free agent thing, it really ain't costing him much, but. Um, I don't know if you've stood next to him lately. I, I forgot how big he was. So like, oh, that, that looks like an NFL tight end, you know? Yeah. So, and for him to, the more comfortable he gets with that position. Now the NFL, it's a different league now. Uh, they got some real dogs over there. All right. So, but that being said, what they're doing with tight ends now at that level, you know, he fits the skill set. You know, really does. And so I, I'd be very interested to see how that works out. I kind of want them to put him in more, we've been so effective in the red zone, but if we ever did struggle, it'd be nice to have a package where you split him outside one-on-one. -on -one, and if they go man to man, most likely they're going to have the linebacker covering him. you know, yeah. and he, that should be an easy win every single time because of his skill set from re his receiver days. Well, he had that reputation coming in, in his freshman years. It, they weren't 50, 50 jump balls for him. It was like 80, 20 jump. Yeah. Ball. He, he has that ability uh, in the in the catch radius to to come down with with uh, just about anything that you oh, want yeah. to throw at him, and we know how accurate KJ can be in those tight situations. Oh yeah. Um, question: This is a good one. This is from uh, oh, yeah. where to go? Here we go. Here we go. Do you think uh, you would enjoy playing in this Bryles offense with KJ? I mean, I, I would probably say no. Okay. <laughs> I would say no just based off of I loved our offense and what we had going on when Petrino was there. Um, there's just so many moving parts when it comes to Bryles, even before the snap. Yeah. And, like, the tempo was so fast, and uh, which is not a bad thing. It's just, yeah. you know – I think so much of that offense is based off of, you know, I would say Browse's decision of what he wants. You know, I think KJ makes a few decisions here or there um, when it comes to hand it off or keep it. Um, but passing wise, you mo for the most part, you see where he wants to go. I really like the freedom we had on offense of going up to the line of scrimmage. Petrino would call a play and Mallet had the freedom to switch it at any time that he wanted. And a lot of it was from input from his receivers. You know, if we saw a, a front that we've seen before, we understand what blitz is going to come. We would always have a signal or something. We would yell out to Mallet to inform him of that. And then he could switch the play. And wow. so, I mean, there was just so many different assets and facets to that offense that we had an amount of trust Um to make it happen. There was only one player we couldn't trust too much. It was Greg Childs. He couldn't read a defense of his life to pin it on. But, 
But <laughs> Greg Childs just knew one thing. He said, I'm open, throw it deep. And it worked about half the time. But uh, the you ain't going to do him yeah. like that. You ain't going to do him like no, that. It's the truth. We'd be like, Greg, was it man or cover two? He said, I don't know. I'm open. Just throw the ball. Yeah. <laughs> I love He's good that. at it. There's no doubt. He could. Uh, oh, he man. He was, he was. People don't understand when I say one of the most talented players I've ever played with was a player who just got. We'd still be talking about him today. I mean, he was a freak of nature. Yeah. And he could catch anything. He ran a 4 three forty. He could power clean over 360 pounds. And not only that, he was a bully. He was a physical receiver. He loved blocking. He, he loved all that stuff. He was a bully out there. And so, yeah. man, I just – I hate what happened with his knee injuries and stuff. But, man, that, that guy was one of the most talented players I've ever been around. Are you still last question? I'll let you get out of here. Are you still pretty tight with 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 those guys? With those guys that you? Play? Oh yeah, we all chop it up. We all have a good time. Uh, I do keep in touch with a lot of my former players and teammates, and uh, you know, I'm actually going to see one this weekend, and I'm very curious to talk to him. Tremaine Thomas, he's the defensive oh. back coach for Bobby yeah. Patricia at Missouri State. So that's right. Yeah, and and it's so fascinating because that guy. I don't think I've ever heard him talk at Arkansas. He was so quiet. Now he was a headhunter out there, and yeah. he was a ball hawk. Had so many interceptions, but I'd be very curious to be like, so what is it like being on the other end? Because as much as Petrino chewed us out as players, he was way worse on the coaching staff. So uh, I'm, I, I'd be it'd be a good conversation for us to have. You could hear him yelling at his players. I remember going to a spring game. I think it was '09, or yelling at his his staff. Oh he yeah, just, he just turned around, and I I've never, and I remember Reggie Herring when he's defensive coordinator for Houston <laughs> I Nut. I remember the stuff that he said to those guys. I remember oh, the man. whole Reggie Herring had some of the most. I mean, <laughs> we could probably talk about it off camera. I can't tell you, we can't say the stuff he said, but he said some stuff that has stuck with me and will for life. I'm like, did he just say that about? I mean, yeah. it's unreal the stuff. His one liners. I mean, he had to have been writing them down. Somebody just didn't think of that. It was insane. Yeah, he, it seemed scripted because I heard some of it, and I and I heard Bobby, you know, and the oh, stuff yeah. getting after Ryan and and all you guys on offense. Oh, I remember oh, thinking, yeah. "Oh my God, I don't know if I'd want to play for this guy." It's funny, as much as we hated it then, us looking back at it now, those are the moments we laugh most about. Like those are the ones we miss the most. It's crazy yeah. how that works. We, I mean, we can sit back and talk about it all day. Well, man, this has been fun. Thank you so much for taking a little time out of your morning to sit and chat with us. Yep. It was an absolute blast to have you yep. on, man. Hey, man, that was a, it was a fun one, and I'm very excited about this weekend. I guess I'll see you up there in the box this week. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be down on the field for a little bit, taking it all in, and then I'll be up yep. in the box. So, all right, yeah. all right there goes my uh, yeah, That's a big like dog. That sounds like a – Yeah, you know, I got my, got my dog out there. People walking up to the windows. We got problems. All right, man, we'll let you go, and uh, we'll have to have you on again, DJ. No problem, man. Anytime. Just let me know. Take it easy. Yep, bye. Oh, get rid of that banner. That, wow, there we go. That's the trick of this, trying to do – there's no, like, one click and then clear your whole screen. How'd you guys like that? DJ Williams, we had him on. That was fantastic. Dudley Dawson delivered. This was a a damn good show, if I do say so myself. I appreciate you guys. Make sure you share – and uh and and uh you know share the content subscribe we're gonna do more we're gonna have dj back on hopefully we're gonna get some more people on and of course we're gonna get otis back hopefully we'll you know when he gets to feeling better we'll have him on for longer so um top three episode of all time ty well i I appreciate that if you're talking about hogville this is only like show number seven so top three i would say this is the best hogville episode although uh, episodes with Otis and Dudley, Kevin McPherson, they, those have all been good. Actually, how many live shows have we done? I feel like we've done, what are we at, like 10, 12? I don't know. Uh, Ty, once again, with the fire content, absolutely. And uh, we're not able to do this without you guys. So remember, again, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Go check out uh, if you need garage door repair. Go hit up Direct Service Overhead, the garage door company. All right? Our show sponsor. Arkansas has a good defense. Only concern is backfield, says Johnny Cash. Love that name. We will talk tomorrow. I'll give you my uh, I'll give you my prediction tomorrow. And on Tusk Talk with Ty on that YouTube channel. So looking forward to it. And I hope to see you there. And go check out hogville.net. All the latest and greatest content from the greatest guys like 
I already mentioned their names, Dudley Dawson, Otis Kirk, and of course, Kevin McPherson. All right, I will see you guys. Some of you I might see tonight in the Discord live on Tusk Talk Discord. And then uh, the rest, I'll see you tomorrow. See you then.